Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Um, I'm really delighted to have you uh, attending this first in a series of webinars uh, to help you become more acquainted with the Ford School of Public Policy at the University of Michigan. My name is Beth Sobolewski. I'm the Director of Admissions and Recruiting for the school. And um, it is my delight to be joined today by our two associate deans. So I'm joined by Paula Lance and Luke Schaefer. Paula is our uh, Associate Dean for Academic Affairs and Luke is our Associate Dean for Policy Engagement. And they are gonna spend some time talking to you about um, the resources at the school, the faculty, um, and we will have time at the end for questions. So um, I would like to invite them to, to uh, join us and um, we'll get started. Hi, everyone. I'm Paula Lance. Uh, as Beth said, I'm the Associate Dean for Academic Affairs here at the Ford School. I'm also a professor of public policy, and I have a joint appointment in the School of Public Health and the Department of Health Management and Policy. I'm a social epidemiologist by training um, and a social demographer and uh, teach courses related to policy analysis, program evaluation, and social, uh, social inequalities in health. That's my main research focus. So delighted to be with you today. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Paula. Luke? Hi, everyone. I'm Luke Schaefer. I'm the Associate Dean for Research and Policy Engagement. Uh, I study social welfare policy in the United States, uh, poverty in the United States, social welfare policy, I have a joint appointment with the School of Social Work, and I also run a university-wide initiative called Poverty Solutions uh, that's housed at the Ford School, and we have lo uh, lots of wonderful Ford School students who work with us. Uh, our mission is to partner with communities and policymakers to find new ways to prevent and alleviate poverty. I also just wanted to note that um, I'm at home, I have kids uh, sort of doing their homework and a dog on my lap and some uh, plumbers here today. So there may be a little extra noise. Um, so it goes these days. Absolutely. Thanks, you guys. Um, so the first question I'd like to ask you to address is, you know, why is a master's degree in public policy important right now, right? What, why might a student decide that this was the right time for them to go to school? So Paula, what, what are your thoughts about that? So I have lots of thoughts about that. Um, I, I think that getting a master's degree in public policy or public affairs is without question a good investment in your future that would afford you a wide range of opportunities for jobs in the public sector, obviously, in the nonprofit sector, but also in the, in the private sector. There's just lots of opportunities with these degrees for cool jobs that um, focus on the role of public policy having a positive impact in, in the world. Um, the MPP and the MPA degree are both generalist degrees and we'll talk in a little bit about the curriculum. So they're degrees that equip people with a wide range of analytic communication and leadership skills so that students with these degrees you know, can land lots of different places. Um, the way we structure the curriculum at the Ford School, however, allows people not only, you know, to get the generalist training for the broad field of public policy and, and public affairs, but also the opportunity to go deep in areas um, of policy, which you feel passionate about, passionate about as well, whether it be social welfare policy, health policy, environmental policy, economic policy, tax, education, the, the list goes on. So again, it's a generalist degree, but with the opportunity to go deep and really become an expert and a specialist. Um, as we all know right now, uh, the world's in desperate need of people who are committed to making public policy and political institutions work better. Um, uh, you know, the world right now needs people like you who are creative and innovative and entrepreneurial. And also, frankly, I'll say people who are kind of mad and pissed off about the status quo and the ways in which things are not working so great right now and the, the ways in which, you know, our, um, our society and, and many places in the world are becoming um, more unequal over time rather than more equal. So, and, you know, and I think it's important, I'm, you know, starting us off here being really honest and, and saying, I think it's important to recognize that public policy 
is an important force of good in the world. I mean, I obviously believe that. I wouldn't have dedicated my career to it. Um, public policy can be used to address complex problems and really in sort of a cliche kind of way, make the world a better place. But we also have to be honest and recognize that public policy is often the root cause of um, structural inequalities and systemic racism and sexism and other force, uh, forms of bias that we have in the world. Public policy um, codifies and, um, and you know, kind of creates status quo in a lot of ways that, that you know, might not align with your values, don't align with my values in many sorts of ways. So again, I think it, it's, time, uh, it's time for us to recognize the role of public policy in, for, for good and not so good in the world. And the field needs, again, creative, um, impassioned, and dedicated people like you to, to make it all work better. Thanks, Paula. Luke, what would you add? Yeah. Uh, gosh, Paula did a great job of um, just highlighting, I think, the ways I think about this. If uh, I'm a, I, I love the Ford School. I love our community dearly. And I think it's a place where if you want to come and you do believe government and public policy can impact people's lives for good, uh, that people can, uh, policies can help people live the lives that they want to live. Uh, it's a great place for you. And if you also believe that sometimes policy uh, can have the opposite effect, right? And can really uh, be a part of the problem and you wanna learn more about that and understand that, this is the place for you. If you wanna learn how to analyze policy because it, one of the things I've learned is that often well-intentioned policy can go terribly wrong, right? And so we really need to do rigorous analysis to make sure the things that we're doing uh, are actually having the effect that we intend because sometimes a uh, policy that is meant to help people uh, in their lives actually has the opposite effect, right? And um, so that's why analysis is so important. So that's uh, what we're about here. And you know, one of the things I admire about the Ford School is so many graduates that go on to do incredibly exciting things. Um, so Steph White is a student of mine and a student of Paula's that was in the, um, uh, the start uh, start up pictures before we got going. She's gone on to a position with the state of Michigan that's helping to coordinate and get more families onto uh, public programs that can help them uh, across. Uh, they, they might be on one and they're not on the other and there's huge levels of bureaucracy and she's working to streamline those. It's a really exciting position. I have another student at the state of Michigan who's running um, economic security policy uh, for the Department of Health and Human Services. I have a an appointment at, at that same department. Paul has been working with the health side of that department. So it's really about sort of digging in and uh, bringing that evidence and research to bear. And I like to think having low egos in the process, right? So if you're someone who wants to learn how to evaluate policy to make sure that it's doing what it should do, wanna learn how to actually make sure that that policy gets implemented and really wanna be about the work and, um, you know, uh, doing whatever it takes, then um, this is this is a great home. Thank you both. So let's uh, sort of narrow down our focus a little bit. We've talked about the field of, of public policy and public affairs broadly, but so, you know, I know I get lots of questions about what makes the Ford School unique and, and makes it stand out amongst various policy schools. So I'd love to hear your thoughts about that. Uh, I guess we'll start with Paula again on that one. Great, thanks, thanks, Beth. So, so why the Ford School? Um, uh, it, as Luke mentioned, um, you know, I too love being being at the Ford School. This is a really unique uh, community in in many many ways, and we can talk more about that. Um, the Ford School, our master's program, it's, um, both the MPP and the the MPA are designed with our brand in mind and what's the Ford School brand, um, it is really strong analytic training, uh, training in economics and statistics and program evaluation and political analysis. Um, and you know, also um, an analysis from a, an ethical and, and a values-based perspective on public policy. So really strong analytic toolkit, multidisciplinary analytic toolkit. Our brand also is preparing people for the world in which communication skills are absolutely 
as important as your uh, analysis skills. So the Ford School is really proud that we put out people who are critical thinkers and analysts, but also really great communicators. And I think the best the resource we have here to really underscore our commitment to that is that the Ford School has four, count them, four writing instructors on our faculty. They all have uh, MFA degrees, um, they are experienced writers, um, and they're experienced teachers of um, the kinds of writing that's important in the policy world, memos and testimony and one pagers and policy briefs and op-eds, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, you know, however great your writing skills are already, they will be moved to the next level um, through your work at the, at the Ford School. Uh, and then also we have a really strong and growing focus on leadership development and leadership skills. And at the Ford School, we just simply define leadership as having a positive impact on others, organizations, and communities. Leadership is about influence and impact and having those skills to change organizations, to deal with and improve uh, complex problems in communities. Um, it's not about being the head honcho. It's not about being the, the you know, top person in an organization. Again, simply, it's just about having that impact, that positive impact that you want. And it's probably the reason you're drawn to, uh, you know, and thinking about going to graduate school anyway. So those are the, those are the really important aspects of our, of our curriculum. I think another thing that really um, is important uh, ab about the Ford School is that, you know, first of all, the University of Michigan is a really big university, right? There's 19 schools and colleges. There are 45,000 students here. Ann Arbor is kind of a dinky little, but lovely, you know, Midwestern college town. Um, easy to live here, easy to, you know, um, outside of a pandemic, do all the fun things you want to do. Um, but the University of Michigan is a big university, and um, but it's also a university with really low barriers between those 19 schools and colleges. And so it's a very collaborative, interdisciplinary, people are not in their silos. Uh, students can take courses at any of the other schools and colleges on campus, and they do. Um, faculty, you know, as Luke and I both mentioned, we, we have appointments in other schools. I know someone on campus who has an appointment in seven different schools. Um, that might seem like a little too much, but that sort of, you know, the world, the world doesn't function in disciplines and silos, right? The world is all very uh, interconnected. And so the Ford School, we're one of the smallest schools and colleges um, at the University of Michigan. So being a small tight knit community is really good for us, but we're a small tight knit community in a big university that's pretty easy to navigate and we can definitely help you do that, whatever your, whatever your interests are. Um, our culture here is that faculty are incredibly accessible. Uh, most of us are here um, because we love to teach and we're so inspired and honored to be learning from the students that we have in our classrooms. Uh, hopefully we're teaching something as well, but it's a, it's a two-way street, especially in graduate school. I mean, the, the learning process is, you know, it's, it's, it's bi-directional, it's multi-directional. Um, so faculty are accessible to students, both in, in terms of the, the teaching, but also their research. We can't get our research done without great students joining our projects and working as research assistants, uh, and again, contributing in, in that way. Um, staff at the Ford School are amazing. I have never worked with such a dedicated, uh, fun and you know, amazing group of people who were very student focused, want to solve every problem that students have, bring all of our resources to bear, you know, ranging from graduate career services to academic support to um, research support to financial support, mental health and wellness support, especially important right now. Um, so, you know, we, again, it, I don't know if you'll believe me when I, I say this, but I actually feel like through, through the pandemic, um, when we at the Ford School, students, faculty, and staff decided early on that what we needed to do is, you know, make sure we had open and honest and transparent communication, riding these waves of, you know, crisis management that started last March, um, being really 
honest with students about what's going on, what are some of the plans, getting student input into, you know, helping shape what the this year is going to look like again in the middle of a pandemic and in the middle of the most weird election stuff that's going on right and also really important issues in terms of social and racial justice going on in the world and so i i actually believe the ford schools become tighter and more more honest and close-knit community in the pandemic than before because we've just had um you know a really sincere um dedication to to communication but also our mission and our mission is serving the public good um and we all you know fort school is not a perfect place that's for sure there's no institution that is but sort of rally, rallying around our mission and you know wanting to be there for each other and support each other through this historic unprecedented time has I think just strengthen the Ford School in, in really important ways. Luke, things that uh, we'd love to hear your thoughts as well. Yeah, I think I'll just uh, uh, doubly emphasize the point of really taking teaching very seriously at the Ford School. So after every semester, there's a um, teaching honor roll uh, that comes out among the faculty. And I think sort of a place on that for classes where student evaluation suggested you really hit the mark as sort of a coveted um, place. I know I look for that. Um, we didn't do it in the spring because it was such a crazy semester and I would have been on the teaching honor roll and it, it still bugs me that I didn't, uh, I didn't get to say I was that semester. So um, yeah, and just really uh, to me, even all the places that I've been, just the mutual respect with students and um, having to be believing that we have uh, a set of skills and knowledge uh, to bring to the table, uh, but also that um, we can learn together, right? And I think some of your colleagues that you'll meet as you go through the program will become lifelong colleagues that you uh, will draw on uh, throughout your careers. Then just uh, doubly emphasizing the place of this uh, strong analytic uh, training. So you'll come in, you'll learn to read research and be able to tell um, what uh, a piece of research strengths and weaknesses are. You'll be able to use the tools to analyze the programs that you run, right? Or if you're working in the legislature, analyze the pros and cons of particular moves uh, that you might push. Um, and the writing, it's just like, there's just no other place that I'm aware of that has multiple full-time writing instructors. And I am a firm believer that however good of a writer you are, you can always be a better writer, right? And uh, continuing sort of to hone that craft, which is really going to be one of the um, most fundamental things uh, in your career in terms of getting your ideas across. Um, is uh, it's just uh, an incredible resource that I'm very proud of. Finally, you know, I'll just say again that I think um, the Ford School really focuses on the applied work, um, as Paul and I have both said, and uh, just you know, looking at the transition teams for a, a Biden administration, having multiple uh, people who uh, are working on the uh, on these transition teams, advising on that, right? Um, we have deep connections uh, at the federal level. We have deep connections at the state. Um, uh, many people uh, working in the city of Detroit, uh, as well as other places. So you know, there's just a hands-on opportunity to really delve in and try out the skills uh, in practical ways that um, has positive impact. Thanks so much, Luke. Um, so to follow up on on both of your points, you know, lots of students have questions about, you know, how do I get involved with the faculty outside of the classroom, right? How do I get involved in research? And there are different projects and that sort of thing. So, you know, can can you just talk to us a little bit um, about about what that looks like? I know there's lots of students that work at Poverty Solutions and the other research centers. So, um, I'll, I'll kick it over to Paula to to start with some examples, and then uh, we'll get Luke's thoughts as well. Right. So I, as I mentioned before, 
faculty couldn't do the the amount and level of research that they do and also the policy engagement work that we all do without the support and help of students so um you know faculty get grants and contracts and have have money to pay students to to work with us on on projects for example i'm working on a project right now with the michigan department of health and human services that's really focused on how do we how do we finance the the growing need and important need for um, supportive housing for uh, low income people who have behavioral health issues, mental health issues and substance abuse issues and I have several students working with me on that on that particular project. Um, there are also lots of opportunities. Um, for unpaid work. Um, I mean, we like to pay students when when we can uh, for sure your time and energy and, and labor are important and valued. Uh, but there are, again, opportunities sometimes for um, students to get involved with work that faculty are doing that, you know, we, we do um, unpaid um, ourselves and but it's important in, in the world. One thing I, I do want to mention is that for Ford School faculty are value, evaluated every year for their teaching, for their professional service work, for their research, but also their policy engagement work. We are expected as, as faculty to be out in the real world and to be listening to policymakers and practitioners and finding out what kind of research and evidence and, and data do you need um, to, to do your work. And then, um, you know, if, when we do research, trying to translate it to policymakers and practitioners so can, it can have that impact. So we involve students in a, a lot of that. Um, and let me just, you know, with, with COVID, let me just give you an example of how um, some Ford School students um, uh, and I tried to be of service to the state health department when COVID hit in March. Um, I reached out to, um, you know, the um, Dr. Janae Caldoun, who's the chief medical officer of the state of, of, of Michigan. Um, really like the head epidemiologist and head health officer for, for the state. Those of you who are from Michigan, you've seen her on television almost every day. But I reached out to her and, and, and said, look, what, do you, what can we do to be helpful? Can I have a whole group of students at the Ford School who want to provide service, want to provide you know, um, research, um, quick summaries of what are other states doing? What are other countries doing that seems to be working? Can we help you? And she came back immediately and said, I would like a memo and you know, gave like five different topics. I would like a memo on how um, racial disparities are emerging from the data in other states. Again, early in the pandemic, um, as the data were coming out, we could see that this was going to be a problem. What do we know about that? What have some other countries done with, elect, you know, with apps and and technology for controlling the virus? Um, so, et cetera, et cetera. But um, uh, you know, it was a way in which board school students could take those important you know, quick policy analysis, quick research scan sort of skills and craft a really good memo in like 48 hours for a person who's dealing with a crisis um, uh, on the ground. So we were, we were really happy and proud to be serving the state in, in that way and, and still are right now. Thank you, Paula. Luke. I know, like I said, I know Poverty Solutions has lots of opportunities for students, so would love to hear about that. Yeah, um, so uh, as I mentioned briefly, Poverty Solutions is a uh, university initiative, but we're housed at the Ford School, and because um, of what we do is so policy relevant, we have tons of uh, Ford School students who work with us um, as research assistants, so uh, many are paid uh, hourly for their work, um, we have some GSRAs uh, for students who have been working with us for a while. We have independent studies. So I'm just going to give you a few examples. So the, the mission of Poverty Solutions is really uh, this engaged work of wanting to get out of the ivory tower and partner with communities and policymakers to find new ways to prevent and alleviate poverty. Um, so we think of poverty really as a, a set of interlinked systems that don't work as they should for families, whether it be housing and education, jobs, transportation. And we really want to try to tackle those systems in ways that have ripple effects for families. Uh, one of our, our biggest sort of clusters of work is in the city of Detroit, 
So we have formed with uh, Mayor Duggan's team a partnership on economic mobility, uh, where we have a number of very sort of targeted strategic uh, efforts to um, tackle some of the issues that the city faces. So for example, one of my staff members is the digital inclusion director for the city of Detroit. So he technically works for me, but uh, through sort of a shared staffing partnership, he sits at City Hall and uh, has students who work with them and they're trying to tackle the digital divide in the city, um, in the city where it's as prominent as it is uh, anywhere else. Um, before uh, COVID hit, uh, they were doing incredibly innovative stuff around uh, library laptop rentals and having some of the most progressive policies around um, accessing laptops from library, getting training to be up and running on them uh, for the longest periods of time, as well as internet connection. Um, and since then, uh, you know, since COVID hit, there was a big push around uh, getting devices to um, DPSCD students. And so Josh, uh, our team member on this, was a part of the, um, uh, a, big, a big part of the effort to get devices and internet access to every student in the city. It was about a $23 million initiative. Some of our other work has been around housing uh, in the So um, uh, tax foreclosure is a major reason why Detroiters lose their home. There are a lot of issues related to uh, unconstitutionally high tax assessments. And then uh, there are some resources uh, through what's called the poverty property tax exemption uh, that are on the books uh, where Detroiters can actually be relieved of uh, tax liability. And those were incredibly difficult to get and there's a lot of red tape around them. So uh, a student uh, in public health was actually one of our champions around some changes that were approved by city council in the city to make that uh, process much more streamlined. And we had partners both among legal advocates uh, and Quicken Loans, the community trust fund has actually big, uh, been a big proponent of this of uh, just uh, spreading the word and doing everything we can in evidence-based ways to get people signed up for that. Uh, the last I checked, we had increased the number of families who had, were getting that, uh, that tax exemption that relieves them of their uh, taxes, uh, which means they can't be foreclosed on because they didn't pay the taxes. Uh, we were up about 30, 40%. So that's a lot of people's uh, lives. Uh, as we were doing that work, though, we saw that there was a major issue with home repair, right? So as families were staying in their homes, we saw uh, significant challenges in terms of, of roofs, in terms of furnaces, windows, and uh, having people embedded at the city meant that some of our Ford School students and one of our fellows were able to really dig in and see that uh, there were some programs to help people with their homes, but there was no strategy, there was no sort of coherence to it. And so uh, Ryan Ruggiero, actually a recent MPP graduate, sort of led the way and sort of helping understand that landscape and identifying some ways, uh, which um, uh, now the city has changed the way it does home repair um, uh, services and supports. And in the process, she actually uh, built a home repair resource guide, right, which was simply sort of a, a document about what was out there. And I was, uh, you know, sort of surprised that this this guide in the city of Detroit it just simply says these are the programs. If you have one of these problems with your with your home, that you can get uh, some financial help with, and it's been like one of our biggest uh, best selling publications. Of course, we you know we don't we don't um, charge for it, but uh, we we made a couple of hundred copies and like uh, we were out of them within a day because people saw that as such a useful resource. We see it as a way to sort of build the, the relationship, right? It's useful to people, but it also uh, allows us to deepen our partnership and really look at policy. Another thing that we recently did in Detroit uh, was a project that you can check out on our, our website, poverty.umich.edu, uh, where Ford School students were uh, instrumental called Investing in Us. We were asked a lot about whether or not we would do uh, community forums to find out what the priorities of Detroiters were for policy change, uh, sort of what they wanted to prioritize in terms of um, people investments in the city. And rather than do new community forums, we thought maybe we will just look at what's already out there. And it turns out uh, over the last eight years, there's been something like 400 different community forums that have 
um, sort of ask Detroiters, what are your priorities for your community? What are the, your priorities for your families? And a lot of these things just get, you know, written and then they go on a shelf somewhere. So in what we think is the very first time anyone's done this, we actually collected all of them. We coded them for consistency and we wrote a report uh, that relies on the voices of Detroiters and we're using that to help set uh, our agenda for policy change in the city. And, and one of the things that really came out of that report, which is something that we've been working on a bit is not just understanding sort of the resource side of the equation. Uh, so there is, you know, interest in jobs, obviously transportation comes up, but the costs of, uh, of living, right? So the, not just the resources, but the costs uh, really came up over and over again, the cost of housing, uh, the cost of things like auto insurance, right? Where the city actually has uh, for uh, many unintended reasons, the highest auto insurance costs in the entire nation, I think probably the world. And, uh, and so that's helping to sort of drive our agenda as we go forward so that we're not just sort of assuming as scholars, we know exactly what the issues are people face and what their priorities are. Uh, but we start with listening, right? And try to let our agenda be shaped um, uh, by what we hear. Yeah, and I'd, I'd like to mention that even though Luke and I both um, have talked about work we've been doing with the Michigan um, state government and Luke's work in Detroit, and I've in the past done a lot of work in Detroit, I just really wanna underscore that the faculty at the Ford School are working all over the world and bringing students into that work with them. We're, um, because we are a public university um, in, a, in a fairly large state and do feel a commitment to provide um, you know, service to our, in our own backyard, so to speak. We do a lot of work in, in the state, but it is not limited to that. Again, our, our faculty and students uh, and alumni go off to, to do important work all over, all over the planet. That's right. In fact, I, I would say, Bala, that's one of the places that we've really just really grown in prominence over the last couple of years. And uh, I know I certainly enjoyed um, it when uh, former Secretary of State's uh, Condoleezza Rice and Hillary Clinton both joined as a part of our sort of diplomacy series. Um, and uh, there's, um, you know, just incredible work being done, not just uh, in Michigan, but yeah all over the world. And it's one of the great things uh, that I enjoy being a part of because I get to learn about those things even though that's not an area of my expertise. Thank you both, that was really terrific. So let's just hop over to the, the questions uh, in, that we have come in in chat. Um, so the first one is one that, that I know I hear a lot but um, would love to have you, you both answer. Um, so it's from a student who says, uh, you know, I have a BA in political science and not a lot of quantitative background. So, you know, how do I prepare of the quantitative coursework? Well, we, you know, we take everyone as they come. Um, the strongest students we had a few years ago was a dance major um, coming in. So with no, no social science really, you know. So whatever your background um, and preparation is, you know, you, you will be fine. We will get you through. Um, there is um, a math camp, math camp um, before the semester starts. If you feel, you know, before you take statistics in the fall, you need a refresher on just basic algebra. Um, what is what is a probability anyway, you know, we, that's an option for you. Um, and we certainly can give, you know, people some readings to do if you want to kind of brush up or you've never taken economics before, but really our core curriculum is designed um, to take people where they are. They are introductory now, if you've had statistics in the past or economics, we have waiver exams. We don't want you retaking things you already know. Um, and we help people prepare for those exams so they can pass them and then they have extra room in their, in their course of study for, for electives. Thank you. Um, so there's a couple of questions in here about dual degrees. And um, as you both know, dual degrees is a big part of the work that we do. Um, there's a question about doing sort of a student initiated dual degree, right? With a program that's not um, one of the formal programs. And there's also uh, a question about joining after they've started their first year at the Ford mm -hmm. School. So, um, you know, both of those things are, are 
perfectly acceptable, but would love to hear your, you talk about that a little bit. Luke, do you want me to do this? This is more uh, on the I, you know, I have side, thoughts but... on dual degrees, which I would share, but I, I might defer to you to, to start out on that question. Yeah, so um, one third of the MPP students at the Ford School are doing a dual degree of some sort. Uh, as I mentioned before, you know, there's 19 schools and colleges and within them, there are just, you know, dozens and dozens of other professional degrees that combine really nicely with the Masters of Public Policy. I think the most common ones we see here are dual between an MPP and an MBA or a JD or the Master of Social Work or the Master of Public Health. But I mean, the, the sky's the limit. And we do have some formal established degree, dual degree programs, but it's also the case that students can, can come and say, I want to do something, you know, that no one's done before, but I want to combine my technical kind of generalist training and public policy with this other specific area of interest for me, like Middle Eastern studies or, or something else. And we can, we can make that work. You don't have to know this going in. Um, it, it's actually the case it works better if people, people doing the dual degree start in one of the programs for the first year because then they get to know their other, they, they enter in a cohort and they get to know people and they take the first year course sequence in that cohort. And then the second year they start the second program. And again, they're in a cohort and they get to know the people over there rather than sort of going back and forth all the time. Um, so you could come and start in the Ford School um, and, or in another degree program and then decide later, you know, you wanted to apply for that, that second one. Maybe some of you are already at Michigan doing a, uh, an initial degree and want to apply to Ford for a dual degree. We, we can make that happen. Yeah, to me, I think the question is, I like the idea of coming and then uh, adding a degree. Um, I think there are questions of just being certain as to what it is you're getting with a dual degree that you don't get with just one degree. So as Paula mentioned at the start, one of the great things about Michigan is our our boundaries are pretty open across departments. So um, could you uh, come to the Ford School and take some classes and get some skills at a, you know, to enhance your skill set at the business school or uh, the School of Public Health? Um, or is there a very specific reason why a dual degree helps you get to where you want to go in a way that a single master's degree uh, doesn't. And so those are the, the questions that I just, you know, encourage people to really think about, talk about, um, even come as uh, if, if that is an option for you, start the program and then see, okay, does it really make sense for me to add on another year to my training um, and do this dual degree or not? Yeah, I, I agree with Luke. It's not, um, it's not a foregone conclusion that, that, two master's degrees is better than one. Um, you know, it's, it, it's got to provide some value added to you for your career goals. So uh, like Luke, I spend a lot of time talking to students to say, do you, you know, do you really need this, um, a, a second degree to accomplish what you, you want to? I also ask people nosy questions. They don't have to answer if they don't want to, but I do ask them, how much are you in debt already? <laughs> What's your student loan situation? And, you know, are you going to have to go more in debt to get that second degree? Um, and again, is it going to, is it going to be worth that to achieve your, your career goals? Sometimes, yes. I mean, some people, people who want to be practice law need a JD and they can't, you know, can't just do that with an MPP. Um, you know, and there are, there's a different skill set and a different sort of credentialing that goes along with some dual degree combinations that really might be necessary for people for the career goals they have. But I'll, I'll just tell you honestly, I've talked some people out of it because I just did, I didn't think there was the value added there and certainly not to go another, you know, X number of dollars into debt. Perfect. So there's a, a, a few questions in here, particularly related to education policy. Um, folks that are interested in, in a variety of different aspects. So just wondering if you guys would talk a little bit about, you know, sort of our education policy, the folks sort of teaching in that arena um, as well. Sure. Luke? Hey, uh, education is a strength for us. Uh, we've got just really terrific people who are working in this space. Um, 
We have the Education Policy Initiative, uh, which is sort of one of our, our centers that uh, does uh, tremendous work in this area and faculty, uh, including uh, Kevin Stang, uh, Sue Dinarski, uh, Brian Jacob, um, who uh, are really leaders. Uh, we have research on uh, higher education. So, you know, one of the great innovations from uh, work coming out of uh, the Ford School has been uh, what became the Go Blue Guarantee at Michigan uh, started as a Hale scholarship where uh, we saw in Michigan that high performing low income students actually don't apply to the University of Michigan uh, at higher rates, um, even though they, they could get in because they don't think they can afford it. And that's partially because sort of, you know, undergraduate uh, degrees are, um, you know, financial aid is just very confusing. Um, and, uh, and so, but in fact, actually, a, a lot of students would get a better deal at the University of Michigan than a lot of the places that I applied to. And the Hale Scholarship uh, was an experiment where we did a real, you know, rigorous evaluation that found that uh, uh, if you change the way you communicate and you just sent out basically like a, a statement saying, if you apply and you get into the University of Michigan, uh, you will receive a, a full tuition grant for all four years. And doing just that, even though that was actually what they would have gotten to begin with, had a massive effect on the number of um, low-income, high-performing students that applied and uh, really changed the, the, the landscape of the, of the student body. Um, we also, you know, our faculty have focused on career and technical education and understanding when do those programs sort of at the um, high school level uh, positively impact sort of trajectories um, some are used jobs, so uh, we have faculty that have um, done some of the top research and understanding how summer use jobs programs uh, may positively impact uh, and under what circumstances. Um, so, uh, you know, there's a strength of, uh, in the work, and I think um, a lot of that will come down, you know, uh, many people will take a class like program evaluation. And uh, a lot of the examples I think will come from educational policy. Okay, yeah, let, let me just, oh, sorry, Paul. Yeah, I just wanna note that for, for the MPP degree, we, we have the option uh, of a, a policy concentration. So we have five different areas in which you could get a policy concentration. And one of those areas is social policy. And we do have a lot of students who are interested in education policy using education policy courses to fulfill that social policy uh, con concentration. So, um, and other people you, you, to get the social policy concentration might take a health policy class and an education policy class and a poverty related class. You can, social policy is a big, big sort of area. But again, there's so many offerings in education policy here. And a lot of students just, you know, take them as electives and then all of a sudden they have the social policy concentration. So I know we, I am cognizant of the fact that we are running out of time, um, but there's, and, and we probably won't get to all the questions, but we'll, we'll give you an opportunity to we'll let you know how to follow up on those. But one question that I think would be great to address in the little bit of time we have left is um, about the ability to take classes outside of the Ford School across the university. And if, you know, what your thoughts are, if there's classes that you've seen that students have particularly really loved and um, how that sort of uh, plays into and, and enhances the education for our students. For the MPP degree, you're actually required to take four credits, at least four credits outside of the Ford School. And people have no, no problem doing that. So again, this, this is a big, big university and our students have such a wide array of interests that they're taking classes all over campus. Um, a lot in the business school, the law school has some pretty, pretty interesting uh, courses that um, intentionally bring people from lots of different backgrounds to solve um, it's comp the complex problem, solving problem initiative. Our students enjoy that. And again, again, all over campus, um, students are, are taking classes. And also the, the graduate school at the University of Michigan, Rackham Graduate School has, last I counted, 50 different graduate certificate programs. 
um, where if you take classes, and these are usually across multiple schools and colleges, you can have another designation on your transcript, which is that you earned a certificate in a certain area. Um, the most popular um, two certificate programs on campus for Ford School students are one in science, technology, and public policy, which we run out of the Ford School. And then the other one is on, um, I might not get the name exactly right, but it's on community organizing and social justice work. That's a very, that's a very popular certificate program among Ford School students. But again, there's 50 of them and sky's the limit. Perfect. Thank you. So I see we're at time. So we did have one quick, quick thing that there was a request to see Luke's puppy. You're ready to He's been on. very well behaved today. Aww, hi, baby. He was napping, so he might be a little unimpressed. This is What's Wilson. his name, Luke? This is Wilson. He uh, He's a COVID dog. Uh, hi, came, Wilson. Came to us from Texas on a love train and uh, he is the most lovely dog unless he thinks you're gonna um, uh, have any have any negative effect on the 11 year old uh, in our home. So then he turns into Cujo. <laughs> I love it. Um, so unfortunately we are at the end of our time. Oh, Ford School mascot, that would be great. We, we have, we definitely have a lot of dog lovers at the Ford School, I will, I will note that. Um, so I just wanted to mention, we're going to have our next webinar on December 3rd. Um, I think Paula's going to join us for that one as well. And we're going to talk about the, the, the tools for influence and uh, that you learn as part of the, the Ford School degree. Um, I dropped in the chat uh, an app, the FSPP admissions mailbox mailbox address if you have follow-up questions and I see that Paula has put her contact information in as well. Yeah the first um, one has a typo use the second one. <laughs> yes it's a z not an s correct right. um, and I see Luke has done that as well so very much appreciate that you guys. Um, we so appreciate your time to our prospective students that have joined us today and um, hope that you can join us for future ones or, or reach out. Uh, we have appointments on our calendars if you want to have individual conversations as well. So just thank you all so much. I hope everybody has a one for, for those of us in the US. I hope you have a wonderful uh, Thanksgiving holiday and um, just thank you again for your time and we will uh, hopefully hear from you again. Thanks Paula and Luke. Take care, everybody. Thanks, and I'm sincere. If we didn't get to so many good questions in the chat box, so please, we are, we are, we want to engage with you. We want to have conversations. So please reach out. I'm around, and we'll, I would love to love to talk with any of you about anything. Hundred percent. All right, guys. Hopefully next time. See ya.